Let's podcast live. Thanks to Sleek Fleet. Check them out online, sleek-fleet.com. It's Thursday. It's 2 o'clock-ish on YouTube. Alongside Joe Giglio, I'm Joe Ovias. I am back from the mountains, Joe. And you made it. Good? Finally. <laughs> you did fuck. You know The Rock? He's he's like back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's a heel right now, though. That's, that's the best Rock, by the way. Yeah, of course. But yeah, like so he doesn't really do his, his catchphrases per se. No, 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 no. But finally, Joe is back from the mountains. So I'm I'm back from the mountains, and you know what I did on my drive back from Bryson City? I do know what you did because you're a sicko. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to some podcasts on the way back. So I actually want to do something a little bit different because I know sometimes things can get a little they can spin out of control. And we do have merch. We do have stuff that's on our branding that says positive vibes only. Okay. So I want to send some positive vibes out to our friend from CBS Sports, Matt Norlander. Yes. Okay. National college basketball guy. Matt's a friend. I consider Matt a friend. I don't know if he considers me a friend, but I consider him a friend. He's been great to us this entire time. And Matt seems to be the only one capable, the only person national capable of going hey acc basketball salute salute emoji yeah man we had all sorts of discourse about you this season we had all sorts of discourse about you last season and yet when it comes to the ncaa tournament the acc continues to be successful so you know what crow about it bang the table say you did a good job that's all apparently joe the only thing harder than correctly predicting the NCAA bracket, which our guy Patrick Stevens, Patrick Stevens is very capable of doing, but apparently the, mo the, the most difficult thing on the planet to do is to say, hey, man, good job. Because the rest of the college basketball national media, as I reentered orbit from my quick spring break trip, I really don't know how else to put it. And I jotted this down. Why does everybody have to be an asshole about the ACC? What am I missing? What did the ACC do to these people? Why is everybody being an asshole? I don't get it. What did I miss? Well, I was gone. I would come up with some concoction for you about elitist institutions and the establishment and blue bloods. And, <sighs> but that's not even like what I don't even think you could do that anymore. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I really don't know. There must be like just deep wounds. But, all across. But, but, but deep points from what? I don't know, man. Maybe you know, I have theories. Maybe you, maybe you were this big, big, big East fan, and and John Swafford killed your league, <sighs> and it's not good enough that you're back and you have the best team in UConn. Yeah, crashing all these conversations and being know. the monster. I don't know. From Matt on the YouTube comments, because when we're live, we go straight to the YouTube comments. Yes, sir. Speaking of Norlander, he doesn't because I heard this podcast. He doesn't believe that this NC State team can be considered a Cinderella. If State gets to the Final Four, do you all think they'd meet the definition of a Cinderella? Real quick, for context purposes, Matt's overall point when it comes to Cinderella's in the modern age, you know, with this expanded field and everything else, you can't be when you come from a Power Five conference. Cinderella's now are reserved for mid-majors to the low majors. And, like, St. Peter's was a Cinderella, right? Yes. Okay. Got it. Butler was a Cinderella. NC State, with everything that's afforded to them, that's not a Cinderella. And I agree with him on that. In this modern era of college basketball, I do agree. NC State's a disruptor. How about that? I like that. That's a very 2024 conversation. So I wanted to go down a few of these things before we talked about some actual basketball and storylines. And I find it weird that everybody's having a really hard time of just copping to the fact that the ACC has done pretty well for themselves in the ACC tour in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Norlander's cohort, M Gary Parrish, at least admitted that part of this is related to liking to dunk on people, right? Like he had his tweets ready to go when Virginia lost, which then begs the question, why, why is it that everybody's so like, has everything ready to go to like, say, see, I told you so about the ACC, but none of that stuff really exists for the other conferences. Like I can sit here and point out that the big 10 hasn't won squat. Right. I can sit here and point out that Kentucky. When, when Kentucky loses to Oakland, it's not about the totality of the SEC. It's specific to Kentucky and what's going on with Kentucky. 
When Virginia gets bounced in the first four, suddenly it's an indictment on the ACC. Well, which one is it? Pick a lane. That's all I ask. That's all I ever ask, which gets us to Joe Lenardi, right? Like Joe Lenardi <laughs> went so far to... Oh, no, there's more. Oh, he went more. He had uh, a follow-up. I'm sorry, you missed it. I, I murdered Joe Lenardi on, on wax on, on Monday. Oh, you did? What did you say? I, I did. What did you say? I did. Because I, I didn't catch Monday's show. <laughs> Completely murdered the man. I caught, I caught the show on Tuesday. You, you can go I'll back go back and, and listen to it. Yeah. yeah, but Lenardi had a follow-up, and he, he essentially said he wants to give basketball fans IQ tests before they can make comments, which is ironic given the fact that his track record when it comes to bracketology should mean he, that, that honestly, should mean he's, he's never allowed on television ever again. Like as if it's about IQ test and showing that you know what you're talking about, Lenardi routinely is dead last when it comes to bracketology predictions, right? Seth Davis goes on a Twitter. He was tweeting Seth through it the Davis, other day. Duke grad. Hmm. Okay. He was contorting himself, trying not to give the ACC's props. He was arguing that the ACC was top heavy. Joe, tell me you did not watch <laughs> ACC basketball this past season without telling me you didn't watch ACC basketball when you say that the ACC, this past season of ACC basketball, was top heavy. Y yeah. I mean, NC State finished tenth. Well, that and Georgia Tech could only beat the teams at the top, and yet finished near the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Then you got John Rostein, who was trying to walk back the hey, the ACC is looking at a real possibility of only having two teams. He's trying to walk that back, like no, 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 that's not what I was trying to say. No, no, buddy, you tweet <laughs> no, in that's very <laughs> binary way. You you are a very ex like you tweet black and white, my dude. You have a track record of this. And you said straight up, no, no, they're looking at a real possibility. There was no real possibility. So now he's trying to gaslight people. And it's like, no, 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 that's not what I was saying. No, 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 your tweets are there, dude. And then there's my guy, Mike DeCourcy. My guy. Mike DeCourcy tried to well actually NC State beating Oakland. Completely memor memory holding the fact that how was Oakland here? They beat Kentucky. And how was NC State here? They beat a mighty Big 12 team the Big to 12. get there. Yeah. Okay. An overseeded Big 12 team. Very much so. And the, the talking points are largely the same. And while I while I agree, while I agree that using the results of the tournament at this point to relitigate what the committee did is not the move. That, that's that's a silly thing. It's like what happens yeah, but with the committee's not trying to make a prediction. That's, right. That's what ACC people, Jim Phillips did come finally come out, made yes. some comments to Nicole Auerbeck. And the talking point you're missing is not the results in the tournament because mm -hmm. the selection committee is making no effort to predict what happens in the tournament. They're trying to use the outline and resumes and their criteria to put teams in the tournament. They're not trying to make predictions. Mm -hmm. So that's the disconnect for me, for some people, and why I said on Monday, you could be mad at the, at the national pundits who are putting the ACC down. But don't be mad at the selection committee. No. For the most part, no. they did their job. Agree. Same with the Big East teams that got left out. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, the answer is you finally just need to outline. We care about who's in this field and mm -hmm. what your record is against this field. Mm -hmm. They would go a long way for themselves if they were to make that an actual part of the criteria. I agree with you on that. And I think people, other, smarter people, I think people who are trying to have an honest conversation about this are not using the tournament results other than to be like, guys, maybe you should look at these tournament results and ask why you talk about the ACC the way you talk yes. about the ACC, which gets back to the jump of this conversation. Why is everybody being an asshole about it? Because I, and it honestly, the, the only answer that I can come up with actually leads to some of the, me thinking the worst things about our own business. And I hate it. Okay. It makes me think in which about context? in the context of it's in the context of in a, in a way I'll be polite first before I get almost rude. I think what's happening and the way people talk about the ACC is further proof of a point that I've been making for years when it comes to college basketball. There is physically no way for you to watch all that basketball. No, none. No, it is impossible to watch all this <laughs> basketball. It is impossible for you and I to watch the entirety of the ACC, and it's only going to get more difficult because I don't know about you, but I do not give a shit about watching SMU Georgia Tech on a Wednesday night. How many times did I tell you I only watched Duke like three or four times this okay. year but, because I shouldn't even have the bandwidth to, to follow them? But you notice that we admit 
there's only so much basketball that we can yeah. watch. And ultimately, we sit back and we will watch the games unfold when it's time to watch the games. And we're not making these huge declarative statements most of the time. Now, there's a reason why I spend a good chunk of the basketball season going to games. You know who I didn't see at a lot of ACC basketball games that I attended to this year, whether it was in Chapel Hill, Duke, or in or, or at NC State? The same people that we didn't see in D.C. at the right. actual ACC tournament? People used to go to the ACC tournament. Yeah. People used to go to a Duke Carolina game. They don't go anymore. Now, there's reasons for that because the media industry sucks right now. You can't yeah. travel. People are kind of locked into where they are and all that kind of stuff plays into it. But nobody wants to admit this. So everybody's like clinging on and gatekeeping to, I'm still an authority on this. And what's the best way to do that? Well, look at the metrics. But the metrics don't tell you the whole story if you don't watch the damn basketball games. And it, it, I'm basically walking up to a line of, this is laziness. It's a lazy argument to start talking about conferences. It's a lazy conversation to be talking about the way John Rothstein goes about these types of things. And I hate that I have to put it out that way, but I'm really left with no choice but to basically say that most of these arguments come from a position of laziness and groupthink. And because you know how college basketball works, I can't watch these games, but I know somebody who was watching this game. Let me call my favorite assistant. Sure. Joe, how does that play out? They give you the best possible version. Sure. Right. And you start kind of placating your guys too. And I see this on social media, man. It's like there's nobody in the ACC that's like doing the huffy face emojis for the teams that, you know, end up winning. You usually see that reserved for a mid-major team because there's a guy on that squad that gives you information. So it's, it is, it is unfortunate that we're at this point. And I hope people actually end up learning lessons from this. I doubt they will. And we'll be back, back here doing this again. Does that mean we engage with it next year though? Have we said everything we've needed to say about <laughs> it this year? And we just move on for it next year. I think so. You but think so? You never know. We'll see. Okay. Okay. Game day decision. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this. All the stuff that's been going on, I think you said it uh, last week, it galvanizes. It galvanizes ACC people. And I've seen this in some... Which of the, is like impossible to do. Oh, I've seen this from some of the people in the comments about saying things like, I never would pull for, N for Duke or UNC or State because of their rivals. Or even Clemson. But now I find myself going, yeah, man, win it. Yeah. Win it, because I want to stick it to the people who have been uh, having a hard time processing all this stuff. We'll get into some of the stuff a little bit later on, like actual games and storylines with NC State and Marquette. We got uh, North Carolina, Alabama tonight. You got Duke and Houston. Uh, but we have some other things to get to. Housekeeping. A little bit of housekeeping. We will be doing it after dark tonight, after the Carolina-Alabama game. Brownlow is going to be doing that with me. You get to sleep tonight, Joe. No, I'm over at the Canes tonight. Oh, you're at the Canes tonight. So actually, yeah. you'll be getting back from the Canes just in time for the second half of that game. There you go. Probably. But Brian Lowe and I are going to be doing an after dark tonight following the North Carolina Alabama game. Uh, big thanks to everybody who has rated us five stars on their favorite social on their favorite podcast platforms. You have subscribed to the YouTube channel. We are approaching 7,000 subscribers on YouTube. And I want to thank Amir, who came by the Longleaf Swine remote last week for dropping off an authentic vintage Four loco, which I, I will drink when we get to 7,000 subscribers, Joe. Yeah, I, have, I have a note from my doctor that says I cannot drink that. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm absolved. So again, we get to 7,000 subscribers. I will drink that Four loco. So be on the lookout for that. A uh, big thanks to Mosquito Authority for sponsoring Ophias and Gilio, Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority. Now's the time to bundle and save all this rain that we've been getting. Oh. It's going to warm up pretty soon. That leads to mosquitoes. You want to get that treatment going now to make sure that you're not getting bit while trying to grill later in the Bundle. year. Bundle and Bundle save. and save. Bugsbite.com. Punch in your zip code. You'll see all kinds of ways. Ace Lancaster and his crew over at Mosquito Authority and Pest Authority can protect your number one investment. That's your home. And I mentioned Longleaf. We did the live show uh, from Longleaf last week. Thanks to everybody who showed up. That was a really great time. We'll be doing it again. We'll definitely be doing it again. And in the meantime, if you're going to settle in and watch the basketball, you know what? You don't want to cook. Get some takeout. Bring it back. Or just watch the games there because they got a nice outdoor patio set up. But if you just want to hang out at home and eat some great food, go to longleafswine.com and order your barbecue. They got specials every night. Sometimes they got the wings. The burgers are fantastic. So again, big thanks to Longleaf Swine for sponsoring Obias and Gilio. And since I just got back from a road trip, this is my, not, I was going to say annual, but this is usually what happens when I come back from a road trip. Shouts to Breeze Through. 
You know why? Because you're on the road and you need to get gas somewhere and you're left with no choice. You're like, all right, let me just hit to the first one that I can get to. And you realize, oh, breeze throughs are nice. Very nice. They're nice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Elevated. <laughs> yeah. Clean bathroom. Good snack selection. Nice organized refrigerator. You don't get that everywhere. You don't, but you get it at Breeze Through. So hit them up, breezethrough.com. Uh, we appreciate them sponsoring Ovias and Gilio. So I come back from the road appreciative of what I've seen. Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group hotline from WUNC NPR, he is Mitch Northrum. He is covering the NCAA Women's Tournament. Mitch, what, what hat do we have? We got, oh, we're going three. We're going Earnhardt. I love right. it. Right. Raise hell, praise Dale. I love that. Plus, you're repping the home field, which we like to see. A proud right. sponsor of Ovis and Gilio. Although I was told that you were rocking the Breaking Tea Dead Conference shirt the other day. I did. I wore the the Dead Conference shirt to NC State's uh, home win in the second round over Tennessee on Monday. Now, I have proclaimed NC State shit is dead. Did you have a moment where you it finally clicked for you that NC State shit is dead? Yes. Uh, our friend Aaron Beard and I uh, talked about this after the game. There was a moment about there was about 45 seconds left and Tennessee had just cut the lead to four points. And um, there was a moment where NC State was trying to inbound the basketball and Tennessee appeared to have gotten a steal. However, Wes Moore had called a timeout. And Wes Moore was awarded that timeout, and therefore there was no turnover. And then NC State scored on the next possession and, of course, coasted to the win. And Tennessee, fa Tennessee fans were very angry about this online. Just another point that NC State shit is dead, because if <laughs> NC State shit was still alive, that would have been a Tennessee steal, and madness would have ensued. Although, uh, although some state fans would tell you, uh, I don't think this qualifies as NC State stuff. That uh, both the women and the men are basically playing at the same time on Friday in the Sweet Sixteen, which they are, which is watch crazy. Both at the same time. Yeah, uh, I, I realized that today as I was just kind of looking at schedules. Um, yeah, the men tip off I think about twenty minutes before the women do, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and you know, Boo Corrigan and a lot of other important NC State people can't be in two places at once, so. They'll have to kind of choose there. But, yeah, that's kind of a bummer. Um, I don't know why someone didn't realize that and maybe mix the times up there. Are you in Albany or Portland? I am in Albany. I am um, currently on the upper concourse of, I think, this building is called MVP Arena. Okay. So what? who do you have? I, just, again, I know you, we make you do this every week, but... <laughs> <laughs> this is the regional round, but the NCAA has basically sent eight teams to one site and eight teams to another site. Correct. So here okay. we have uh, the Albany one regional and the Albany two regional. So on Friday, we'll get South Carolina against Indiana, and then we'll get Notre Dame against um, Oregon State. And in Albany two, we have LSU on Saturday going against UCLA and Iowa going up against Colorado. So um, the Sweet 16 matchups, you know, those are those. Uh, so the Elite Eight, you're looking at a potential South Carolina-Notre Dame rematch and a potential Iowa-LSU rematch of last year's national title game. I, I saw on Twitter that, I think it was Yahoo who, who wrote a story that said, women's basketball has finally arrived because people were mad about the star treatment that Caitlin Clark was getting. Mm -hmm. from the officials in the second round game what was it egregious mitch or was it more of people like to find something to complain about and then complain about it i think there are you know officials were favorable i think to iowa but there are also a lot of loud people online that um i think are just tired of hearing about caitlin clark um there's sort of this you know there's a one subsection of women's basketball fans that think she's really great for the game and you know she's a supernova she, i mean she's mm -hmm. one of the greatest we've ever seen and then there's another subsection of fans that think that she's sort of overshadowing everyone else um and sort of taking up a lot of spotlight and stuff and i think those people are just looking at something to be mad at um i mean there's a couple like complaints you can make like does espn really need to have a dedicated reporter to just follow caitlin clark around I don't know. I sort of made the argument that Caitlin Clark finally, you know, in women's college basketball, 
she's being treated like a, any other superstar in any other sport would be treated like. Um, you know, the way she is being covered reminds me a lot of the way that Zion Williamson was covered at Duke. Right. And so I think that this is a good thing to see, that she is receiving a superstar treatment that we would normally see in college football or men's college basketball. I think the one thing that women's basketball has going for it right now that it's never had, because normally there's one monster in women's basketball, or there's two. You know, forever it was Tennessee and UConn. Right now they have stacked. They have four interesting national stories yeah. in Iowa, LSU, UConn, and South Carolina. And then depending on where you are regionally, like if you're a state fan, cool. You mentioned Colorado before having a little bit of a run. Indiana state fans will remember from a few years ago knocking out one of West's teams. So I think there's some pockets there that the, the women's game has never had before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we are, you know, there's been like some complaints about, um, you know, the women's side not having the same amount of upsets on the women on, as on the men's side. But look, I mean, three teams lost on their home courts this past weekend with Ohio State going down to Duke, Virginia Tech losing to Baylor, um, and Kansas State losing to Colorado. Um, you know, so there are upsets. There are other storylines. I mean, I didn't think this Duke team was going to be in the Sweet 16, but the defense is clicking and Reagan Richardson shooting the lights out. Um, I think NC State's a really interesting storyline. And that's probably like the most interesting, one of the most interesting Sweet 16 games, you know, them against Stanford, a future ACC matchup. I just want to point that <laughs> I love, out. I love that. I love that. What's well, interesting, I'm glad you brought up the, the home court losses because I know that's another conversation. Again, this is another sign that the women's tournament has, quote unquote, arrived, even though it's been watched and everything else. People cover it that people want to have those first two rounds go to neutral sites rather than what we're seeing at, at home. But again, home teams did lose. Uh, it, it is something that does happen. So I don't know if they're quite there yet. I also think it's interesting that, like, well, for instance, sometimes these teams are just stacked and you can't do anything about it, right? So there's like a, there's a double-edged conversation around that South Carolina, North Carolina game, right? I, I can recognize that North Carolina is on a different level. What I did not expect was for North Carolina to get wrecked like they did uh, in that game. And some people want to equate that to, well, it's the setup and everything else. I don't know if the setup had anything to do with the fact that South Carolina was going to beat North Carolina straight up. I, yeah, I think on that day, those two teams, the way they were, I mean, North Carolina has no depth right now at the end of the season. Um, you know, the only guard they had coming off their bench was a freshman in Sydney Barker who was a walk-on who just got awarded a scholarship a couple months ago. I mean, they had zero guard depth. And South Carolina, I mean, they have a, 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 their bench could go start at another Power 5 school. Like, that team is just loaded. And that was arguably, like, the best half of basketball, the first half that South Carolina played, that I've seen anyone play all year. Um, I mean, they're just a juggernaut. I, it doesn't matter where that game would have been played. I personally like the um, on-campus games in the first round. Um, I don't think that the women's tournament needs to aspire to be the exact same as the yeah. men's tournament. Yeah, I we'll think it's, I think it's a feature, not a bug. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's really cool. I think it also puts more value into the regular season because you are fighting for that top 16 seed to get the right to host um, in the first round. I mean, a lot of teams are kind of shooting for that and jockeying for, for, for position um, to get that. And they just set an attendance record for the first two weekends of the NCAA tournament. Um, on the women's side for the first and second rounds. I don't think you would have gotten that if, you know, I made this example on Twitter, if you took, you know, the teams in Columbia and the teams in Baton Rouge and shipped them up to Brooklyn or something in the first weekend. All right. Let's talk about NC State before we say goodbye. Like You, you said this shit was dead. Dude, have you looked at their bracket? What? I just mentioned all those teams. They're not with any of them. Right. It's a dream. And you got, what was it, in this last game? couple freshmen stepping up right? I, I used this, to read word up magazine are you kidding me <laughs> you know you can be we, we sit here and we talk about older teams this and transfers that what a couple freshmen stepping up that's still you're still capable of doing that in college basketball who knew right so yeah. to joe's point nc state's bracket is nice for them it is yeah um you know stanford's a really good team but like they're not unbeatable. That's a team NC State can beat. Um, mm -hmm. I think the key there is going to be NC State's guard play. Um, Sanaya Rivers, Isaiah James, and the freshman that you mentioned, Zoe Brooks, who all played really, really well against Tennessee. And we're kind of the difference. I mean, 
Tennessee and, and Stanford are sort of made up in the same way in that they have these two really good front court players for Stanford. It's Cameron Brink and Kiki Irafan. Um, and, you know, NC State um, took care of business against Tennessee's really good bigs and Tamari Key and Rikia Jackson. Um, Rikia Jackson's going to be a top three WNBA draft pick, just like Cameron Brink is. I think um, NC State should match up pretty well in that game. It's, it's going to be a really entertaining game. And on the other side of the bracket, you have a Texas team that has played half the season without its best player, Rory Harmon, who went out in December. Um, and then you have a Gonzaga team who – Gonzaga's good, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think they scare NC State by any means. Mitch, we appreciate the time as always. Uh, we'll check in next week uh, to talk about NC State, both men and women being in the Final Four, right, <laughs> since NC State shit is dead. I think so. DJ Burns and Isaiah James dancing into uh, Phoenix and Cleveland. <laughs> I love it. Mitch, appreciate it, man. Take it easy. All right. Thanks. Big thanks to the Butcher's Market for sponsoring Ovius and Gilio. Check them out. Thebutchersmarkets.com. Um, I appreciate the listeners for posting their meat. I love that. Just the tips. <laughs> Look, it's all about getting the quality cuts, put them on the grill or putting them in a recipe and seeing what you come out with. And uh, at some point in the spring here and the pollen goes away, people are going to be out there grilling. It's going to be a lot of fun. So please post your meat. We love to see that when you when you post your meat. And you can check them out, thebutchersmarkets.com. Big thanks to Two Roosters for sponsoring Ovias and Gilio. Check them out online, tworoosters.com. Uh, they got new flavors all the time. You can go to the website to see what flavors they have at their various locations, including their special one-offs and everything else. Gilio, did you try something new? No, 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 no. Since you don't watch the show, I want to give you a quiz. Okay. I'm going to set the over-under of gallons of Tuffy tracks that Two Roosters has sold since last week. Gallons? Gallons. I'm going to set the over-under of their gallons. This is not the OG gambling syndicate segment. Not yet. yet. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. But Jared texted me. Yeah. So I'm going to set it at 148 over. and a half gallons. Over. You're, you're that confident. I'm that confident. 148 is a lot of freaking ice cream, It Joe. is, but state fans are <laughs> gobbling up everything. More than 200 gallons. That's awesome. Of Tuffy Tracks, which I they still that. have, by the way. Okay. They had the, he made more. All Jared right. made more. Perfect. Man. Perfect. So go check it out. Tuffy tracks over at any of the two roosters locations. We appreciate them for supporting this program. And if you're going to the Canes game tonight, they got a two roosters location at PNC arena. You can get the stormy tracks or yes, you can, or you can get the Sunday in the helmet with the sprinkles. Speaking of you not watching the program, that, that was my end cap. Like I for told one you. of the episodes, like I told you, I was very proud of myself. I, I was working on things, uh, uh, working through some things, yeah. working on some things. Yeah. Uh, no, there's some things good. that I need to update you on. Like I'm proud of you moving the little boxes down so you covered up names. Like look I'm, at you being I'm, ingenious. I love it. That was a yeah. Part of that was the struggle. I love right. that. Uh, hometown Realty. Check them out. MyHTR.com. I'm actually headed to Garner tonight because of a Canes clinic, uh, a hockey clinic for the kid. And when I go to Gardner, what do I see? I'm blessed by the sign. Blessed by the sign. I will always you saw associate the sign. You and Asa base. Yes. I will always associate that sign with championship. That's right. Because it blessed Jacob's Junior Canes team to win a CHL championship. You opened up your eyes. You saw the sign. Now you need to open up your eyes. And when you sell your home, <laughs> use the experts. Hometown Realty. It's myhtr.com. Don't think you can do this and make as much money on your own. Use the experts. Go to myhtr.com. I think it was I think it was when we did the show this past weekend, an OT, and I brought up the Marquette thing. And I'm like, hey, you got this storyline of Shaka Smart, right? <sighs> okay. Who was at VCU and gather myself when NC State was going through another coaching search. This was the post Sydney Lowe coaching search, right? And it was a hell of the, the sabotage coaching search. Okay. And Jared Fialco, my former colleague. Is uh, now North Carolina. I, hold, on time. hold on a second. This fired up a little too early. So Jared Fialco, who um, is at a different TV station now, uh, WISN, he caught up with Shaka Smart, and he asked him about that 2011 coaching search for NC State, 
and his association with that job. And here's what Shaka Smart had to say. Not to dwell on ancient history, but as someone who was working in North Carolina at the time, when Sidney Lowe was relieved of his duties in 2011, a lot of folks thought that you would be coming to Raleigh. How close were you to accepting the North Carolina state job then? Not close. There you go. Not close. How close were you to taking that job? His answer, not close. Joe, have you composed yourself? I have. I have, because multiple things can be true, right? First of all, do you, you want to do the whole thing or you just want me to do the Shaka part? You, you pick, pick your own adventure here I on think, your way back. I think for, I think for the purposes of this conversation, we can just do the Shaka, the Shaka part. part. Yes. Let's okay. just do the Shaka part. All right. So, so Debbie had other, Debbie L, AD at the time, had other people ahead of Shaka, but this was someone she identified because remember recruiting really mattered to Debbie. And remember, he was at VCU, could recruit the D.C., Northern Virginia area. Mm -hmm. There was no reason why he couldn't recruit North Carolina and South Carolina either. He had some time at, at Clemson as well. So this was someone who was young, who she identified. It just so happened to be that VCU was in the first four. Now, VCU became a team that went from the first four to the final four. But all the while, NC State's search remained open. Mm -hmm. Well, why was that? Why? Why would it? Logically, why was that? Yeah, yeah. Because he had said, I will talk to you, but not until the team has been eliminated, basically. Not until my season's over. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yes, fair enough. You weren't close. But the conversations that you had with NC State and Debbie Yao led to a significant raise for him at VCU and a practice facility at VCU. So much to the point that when I went and saw Will Wade... <laughs> Five years late, six years later, I texted Debbie a picture and she goes, oh, I see you're in front of my practice facility. <laughs> so, yes, Shaka, nobody blames you for not taking the state job. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. to act like, and I get it, the framing of the question lent itself for you to say that you were not close. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is you were able to leverage, if nothing else, NC State's interest in you in a significant raise. <laughs> And a new practice facility. And yes, when Debbie said at the press conference where she announced hiring Mark Gottfried, when she talked about sabotage, Shaka was the coach allegedly who Gary Williams reached out to and committed the sabotage. So for all of history, we will have the sabotage comment from Debbie. Mm -hmm. And that was the coach that she was speaking of. Okay. 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 I'll spare you the rest of this. <laughs> Well, we have an entire off season. I will spare you the rest of this. We have oh. we have an off season of things to discuss. Okay. Like I have I like there's a lot of gambling drama going on right now in the world of sports. I have yes. I have thoughts on that. I know you addressed it some of it yesterday with Brad Frisch, who was hanging out with you yesterday. But I, I have my own thoughts that I just don't have time. We don't have time to get to it no. today. Just like I wanted to just focus on the shock of smart part of this. And I'll 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 add this to the to the conversation. In the history of college coaching searches, really any coaching search, right? The job is only offered to the person who accepts it. Only. It's all in the yeah, framing legally of the in such a way that you yes. could say, oh no, I never was offered, even though or or I never spoke to that person, <laughs> even though you have search firms, back channel conversations, X, Y. There's all sorts of cover in how you frame it right. that makes it sound like, oh no, never I do that stuff, right? I mean, we also live in a world where Josh Pastner openly told you that he gave Debbie Yao the stiff arm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So at least he just straight up says, yeah, I'd said no. This is a little bit more semantics, right? In fairness to Shaka, he stayed at VCU for four more years before taking the Texas job. Yeah. So when he says he wasn't close, I would, I would imagine in his own mind, he had already seen Anthony Grant leave VCU for Florida. He had already seen Jeff Capo leave VCU for Oklahoma. Yeah. So in his mind, he was thinking to himself, I can do what now that I've been to the final four, I can mm -hmm. do a whole lot better than NC State in his mind. Now, keep in mind, it didn't work out for him at Texas. And the reason he went to Marquette is because he didn't know how to play the game at Texas. And the reason it works for him at Marquette is because he's gone and all and actually gotten some players back from the D the Baltimore DC area mm -hmm. because that's where those were his best teams.
Mike Maniscalco, Canes play-by-play Bally Sports, joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline. Did you know you could sell your car to Heaster? I did, actually, yeah. You can. You, you can. get your Heaster down to Heaster, boys. I might be getting I – might, I might have to call up Bennett because I'm going to have a 16-year-old here on Monday, and we got to start thinking about getting him a vehicle. So oh, that's where we're at. That's smart how, move, Joe. See, that's yeah. how old we all are, Mike. We can still relitigate things that happened in 2011. Was shot smart and the NC State coaching job, and I have a 16 year old now. He, he I, when was, I when I first met you, you didn't have a 16 year old. No, I had, had a, I had a three year old at that time, yeah. and uh, no, 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 no. When no, no, that was late, earlier than that. He was just born. Yeah. Now that I'm actually getting all the and Jacob wasn't even born. 17 years. <laughs> and Jillio, I mean his his yellow pads were white. <laughs> Speaking of white, to my because beard, they. Now. Because white paper turns to yellow over yeah, time. Yeah, I, I see. I see what you did there. Wow, I now I see where you were going. Come on now. <laughs> I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Um, speaking of seeing where things are going, do the Canes want to win the Metro Division? Yeah, I think you do. Uh, just from the standpoint of, and say this one with me, uh, you want Game Seven at home. You, you just do. So, yes, yes, they do. There's a, a very short answer to that. Um, not to do your job. Can the more, they? The more, it, more it, interesting it, it, question is, is it better if the Canes do not win the Metro Division? That's the more interesting question. How Okay, what, how is it better if they don't win it? Because if things hold to form, you'll either play the Philadelphia Flyers or the Washington Capitals yeah. or on paper – you would say, well, that is a lesser than opponent. By the way, there is no easy out in the NHL. Uh, I'm going to put the asterisk on that one. Whereas if you win the Metro but don't end up winning uh, the – it would be the President's Trophy more than likely, meaning the best record, you would get the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round, who I think are a much more dangerous opponent if we are being honest and having a conversation like that. Well, I guess it gets to my other follow-up question to this as it relates to the Metro – are they? Do they have enough time left? Enough games left as we are dwindling down to the final weeks of the regular season? Yeah, I mean they've got nine games left, okay. so it's it's not impossible, but it's it's one of those things where uh, you, you start. And honestly, this would be a great great time for the the yellow pad for Joe Gillio <laughs> to break down uh, strength of schedule versus games on the road versus the opponent's record with what they're going for and everything that comes into play here. If you look at it, the Rangers have tougher opponents, but more games at home. The Canes are a five, four split with, uh, home games being four, five on the road. So you kind of, you try to figure out what the math is, uh, which would be the, the harder road to hoe. I will tell you the last four games that the Canes play, Boston will be tough on the road, uh, but then they have the break, and then they finish up with St. Louis, Chicago, Columbus. Uh, St. Louis, I think, will be out of it by the time the Canes get to that game. Chicago is playing for maybe the worst pick again, or the best pick, I should say, the worst record. Same thing with Columbus. So you're going to play two teams that probably do not want to win uh, the last game or the game that the Canes are playing. Let's just make sure Alex Nedeljkovic isn't anywhere near oh. the Hurricanes in the playoffs, please. <laughs> I mean, that guy, I mean, turns into Patrick Waugh when he yeah. plays the freaking Canes, That's man. Funny, right? Holy yeah. smokes. I mean, the, the, the two games this year, he was the difference. Uh, <laughs> Sidney Crosby has a lot to say about it, too. But sure, uh, he sure. was the difference for Pittsburgh. And then last year, I mean, he stole the show for Detroit in, in a game against Carolina. Where Late. the Canes, I mean, you know, it was a pepper, tons of shots on him. But uh, the, the Canes didn't do everything to make his life miserable. But, man, he was outstanding. And, and I think that we've seen that he's an NHL goalie. I know that there might be – everybody will always think of, well, we had this guy in our system or this guy played for us. Why didn't we keep him? Uh, I, I like Alex Nedeljkovic a lot. He had an opportunity in Detroit to really take the reins, and it didn't happen. Of course, Detroit, not really a great team when he went to them. Uh, this Pittsburgh team, not really great. He's still searching for consistency, but when he sees that Canes uniform, Julius is 100% right. He he turns into just Patrick Wap 2.0. I mean, he is unbelievable when he sees the Canes uniform. All right, help my Canes brain out here because when I think about Canes and getting new additions. I, I guess most of them have been on the defensive end, and maybe that's where the answer is. But I think, man, it, or, or love, you know, it takes a minute to figure Burns, it takes a minute to figure out how to play with these guys. Jake Gensel's out here, like, okay, let's go. 
I got a I got a cup to catch here, people. I'm out here like I mean, it looks like he was born in Finland. Like, what the hell is going on with this guy? Why is he so freaking good right away? Because he uh, is that responsible, and he's been that way his whole career. Uh, his dad was a coach and taught him how to play. And and for me and Rod Brindamore, and you guys have talked to Rod about this. Whenever you start talking about points, he's going to go. It all starts in the defensive end. It all starts in your own zone. And Jake Gensel is such a smart player. Uh, you, you want the high hockey IQ, Joe? Uh, <laughs> I'll give it to you right now. He has it. And you can put him anywhere. And then you can put him. The other part of it was good players. If Guinea Kuznetsov and uh, Rod had a really good line to start off, which is you put two guys who don't know the system on the same line. That way you're only worried about one line instead of two lines. Maybe you've got guys trying to figure it out. But it's the first time he's ever played man-to-man. You talk about defense. It's funny you would think in hockey it's the same thing. It's not. Uh, a lot of times when a defender is out of place in the NHL, you notice it. It's a problem. Forward, yeah. When a forward is out of place in the NHL, you're generally blaming the defender for being in the wrong place, trying to cover up for the forward. So especially if it's a system that they've never played before. But, you know, Jake Gensel just fits in perfectly. And the thing for me, um, you know, you get to watch this. I don't know if you guys ever experienced this with any of the players that you covered, but both Gensel and Kuznetsov, their passing ability is unbelievable. And for Gensel, it's in, you know, the, the tight areas, those little six foot passes. He finds a way to get them through skates and sticks to where they need to be. And I have yet to see Kuznetsov throw a pass that isn't flat going across to a player. So uh, there's still an adjustment curve for Evgeny Kuznetsov, but uh, for Jake Gensel, you know, playing with the guys that he's playing with, having the ability that he has, I, I am, I'm not going to lie, Joe, I'd be lying if I told you, oh yeah, I thought he'd have 12 yeah. points in eight games, <laughs> but uh, he, he would be the closest thing to what was available. That would be plug and play for what Carolina is. And he's, he's proving that right. And it, it didn't take very long to put Gensel with Aho. And you put that with Jar because we talked about this shortly after the the trade deadline. I remember we talked about it with Luke DeCock as well. It's like, okay, the Canes can actually do something with Gensel that they haven't really been able to do before, and that's put a line out there that's kind of like a hammer, yeah, um, which is what you need once you get to. That's the one thing they've truly lacked, whether through injury or whatever setup that they just had not had it in the playoffs. I love that they've put it together now, and clearly it's paying off with how everybody's numbers have elevated together. It's very it's very cool to see. Yeah, no, I mean. They're- you take a look at the six games that they played together before the game in Pittsburgh. Uh, and it's no fluke that Sebastian Ajo had six goals and six assists <laughs> over those games at 12 yeah. points. It's no fluke that the majority of the points that Gensel had is with that. And Seth Jarvis was on a six game goal scoring streak uh, during that time. You know, that's one of those things where you look at it, you know, if you, you stack all three guys on their shoulders, I think they barely clear, you know, seven feet tall. It's, it's a joke on that one. But, uh, you know, they're not very big guys, but the way that they play, they put themselves in the right spots. The other thing I like about this is if it does come to fruition, Joe, if Kuznetsov, Natchez, and Svechnikov can come together, now you've got two lines that the other teams in the playoffs are like, what the hell do we do with this animal? Because th- it is a different – looking line than what the Canes have if that gets going. But yeah, the, the Canes have a hammer line right now with Aho, Jarvis, and, and Gensel. And the good thing is you can play them against anybody. You don't have to to hide them. Like maybe in years past, you'd mm-hmm. have to hide or get Sebastian Aho away from a Patrice Bergeron. You don't have to do that now. I, I don't know, Joe. Nine games left. I'm getting I, excited. I see nine games left. We saw Rod, what, two or three weeks ago. We told him, oh, you're in the great game now. You're in the end game. He was like, ah, he gave us a got, man. He gave us, I don't know about all that. Yeah. But here he is after I see him after uh, the most recent game. And he was in full on gripping it tight after a win. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, we're there. We're in the end game. It's time. Because I'm like, hey, sh- surely you're enjoying your family. I-, I knew I knew he wasn't. But I'm like, surely your family is enjoying NC State's success right now. Mm-hmm. And he was like, <laughs> he, 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 yeah, no, he is. He is locked in. He is locked in. <laughs> Come on, man. I saw him. this I, is the first time, Rod, you've even been able to enjoy any in your history of NC State fandom to have a moment, sir. I saw him at weight competition center last night. He's locked in. Still, no, he's, it's, it is. It's, it's over. Focus. We'll man. see him in the summer. Focus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Seven thirty tonight against the Red Wings. 
Actually, go no to Delkovich. I got first period Kane today. Let's go. Actually, so it's funny. I actually saw some people wearing Red Wings jerseys walking down Fayetteville Street earlier today. Oh, yeah. Oh, they, they, oh. Hey, they, tra- they travel. Shout out to Brown Low. There you go. Is that? Yeah, there you go. That's for that's a little talk radio. Yeah, yeah that, I didn't really fit one in for us here. Uh, <laughs> today, so they travel. Their fans travel. They travel well. They travel uh, so well. All right, Mike. We'll talk to you later, man. All right. You got it, guys. So I had a moment leaving Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Tennessee. Okay. So there were some storms that came through the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, and they shut down the main access road that got us from an area called Cades Cove back to Bryson City. So we had to detour. And I was like, all right, kids, you guys wanted to go to Gatlinburg? It's time to go to Gatlinburg, which I have strong opinions about Gatlinburg. Not my scene. No. Not my scene. No. But the kids love a mountain coaster, those little alpine coasters. Okay. And then I found a steak joint that was surprisingly cheap, but also really good. Very thrown off by this. So it was a two-hour drive back because we had to go around the park. No, you can't go through. Can't go through. We had to go around. That's a two-hour drive. Yeah. So I'm I'm in a bad mood. Damn, I got a two-hour drive ahead of me. All right. Uh oh. I hope you didn't get a ticket. Gallenberg's 35 miles an hour uh, throughout the oh. entire city limits, but it's oh. like wide open spaces. So I was going 56 in a 35, just not paying attention. I just thought I was out of the city, highway driving. Here we go. I got pulled over. But you got out of it. But I was like, ah, crap. I got a story for Joe, Whitaker and Hammer time, right? <laughs> I was like, I might as well. Right, here we go. I know who to call Whitaker and Hammer, wh.lawyer. But no, for the first time ever, I got a warning. Nice. In all of my years of speeding tickets, I've never gotten a warning. Did he look at your license and say, hey, it was your fact, birthday? Kelly and I, Kelly and I were, I was trying to figure out the last time I got a speeding ticket was, was actually birthday related. I'm, I'm closing my ears for you now because it's when you turned 40. <laughs> and I was driving downtown because we got on that yeah. damn, uh, that trolley. Yeah. The Raleigh trolley to drink, right? Remember the battery died on that thing too? Mm-hmm. So we actually had to pedal. So I was driving downtown through Glenwood to meet up with you all for your 40th birthday. And that was the last time I had a ticket. Knock on wood. But if you do get one, Whitaker and Amer. Oh, dude, I was ready. WH that lawyer. I had and, the whole I had the whole ad ready to read. Like, and, all right. <laughs> and don't forget, we're having our birthday celebration. Yes. May 3rd at Shady's in downtown Garner. You don't need our birthday to, for a reason to celebrate over at Shady's. Check them out. Unbelievable drink selection. Downtown Garner. I'll actually be at Shady's tonight. I mean, oh, they're having the games on. Jacob's got a clinic, and you got hockey. He's got a clinic. It's it's two minutes from the rink. One minute, yeah, not even. Yeah. Depending on the light you could cycle, walk. you could but, actually yeah, walk. You probably could walk. Yeah, yes. you're right. So I'll be at Shady's tonight, watch some basketball while he's at his clinic. Big thanks to Matt Davis. Speaking of Garner, the G insuregarner.com, D O G insurance.com. Call him directly now on 979-8277. and you can start saving money on your home and auto. Or if you want to, you can just put your camera up on that QR code and you'll be good to go. So again, big thanks to State Farm. You saw Mitch wearing a home field sweater earlier today. It's not too late to still use that promo code OG23 as if you're feeling nostalgic about your favorite teams in the Sweet 16, all these ACC squads, guess who's got some really cool vintage inspired stuff? Home field. Check them out. Homefieldapparel.com. Use that promo code OG23. Again, that's OG23. Uh, this is from, <laughs> from Michael <laughs> regarding my warning. NC State shits over for Joe O too. See? Tell me it's not dead. Tell me it's not dead. You love to see it. Absolutely love to see it. Joining us now on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline is Jordan Cornett. He's with Westwood One Radio, NBA TV, and more importantly, the leading shop locker in the history of Notre Dame basketball. Jordan, how are you, my friend? 
Don't forget NB, NBC Sports now, man. <clears throat> I can't keep track of all of them, man. Certainly, certainly not ESPN any longer, but i uh, got some great things going. Life has been fantastic to me. I'm just trying to figure out what in the F is going on with your hair, brother. What is that? I, I, okay, so you, you said that, and I was like, all right, is he mad at me? I like or, it. Or, or is it like, is it a criticism or is it? More here, here's my question. Do you do it like, oh, look, like I'm not trying, but like it's perfectly coiffed in the way that I want it to look. That's what I'm trying to figure out. No. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I feel like Joe explains his hair. A lot of people have this question. So when my hair is shorter, I use a pomade, which is like a, a harder gel, right? And when I use the pomade, it just that thing is like a hard, it doesn't move. But when my hair gets longer, I can't use a pomade. I actually have a paste. Though this is a cream that I use. I did not use it today because my hair is fine today. I just took a shower, right? But later in the day, you'll see me and I'll probably have the cream in my hair. It's just a matter of there's temperature, uh, humidity. All of these things are in place. You're carrying around a lubricant with you all day long. Yes. 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 Interesting. Yeah. You got to be prepared, man. <laughs> I to be prepared. And I was told lube was on the things on the list to be prepared for. <laughs> the jokes I can make. I've already <laughs> lost one job. I'm not going down that road. Ah, you're good, man. You're good. You are um, out in the East Regional. You're in Boston. Yep. So I want to start there because obviously we've spent a lot of time this week talking about our teams. And I do want to get some of your thoughts on our teams. But first, is there any way around that UConn is a freaking monster, man? Monster, and I got a taste of it, uh, JG, at the end of the year, towards the end of the regular season, into February, when UConn hosted Marquette in a game, I think it was two top five teams at that point, and UConn throttled them. Now, UConn did turn around and get aired out at Creighton uh, in a game where Creighton was just lights out from three very shortly after, but what it comes down to, what I was able to surmise in watching that game, when UConn's at their best, it's the tournament's a waste of time. If they're at their best, nobody's beating them. Forget it. Yeah. If they're at their best, nobody's beating them. Beauty of the tournament is sometimes teams aren't at their best. But the beauty of UConn is even if they struggle like they did from three last time out, they can still hurt you in so many different ways. They're a great offensive rebounding team. Donovan Klingon is Zach Eady down low, except he can come out and guard on a perimeter and can move laterally. Um, so he's not just anchored down low like a Kalkbrenner for Creighton. Uh, he's different as a, as a mobile big uh, that's disruptive. They can switch so many things. They're great in the half-court setting because uh, they got two guys that shoot better than 40% from three. Uh, they got pros on the roster, and they are great in transition. I, I just look at this team and go, okay, where's the vulnerability? I mean, they shoot the ball well. They take care of it. They're right up there in terms of offensive efficiency. I think they're number one in offensive efficiency, and they're 11th in defensive efficiency. They're an incredible team, but this tournament, wacky things happen and styles make fights and a style could catch them and it could be really interesting. I just don't see it happening here in Boston. I do believe that they're going to get to Scottsdale, Arizona. My theory all along, and, and they were in the toughest region to me. Now, Auburn losing certainly takes a little bit of, uh, of one I of the Scottsdale, right? by the way. I think it's Phoenix. I just like Glendale. You're good. You're Glendale. good. They're one of the Dales. Um, I, my theory was they wouldn't get to Glendale, but if they did, they're not going to lose. And I, that, that probably still holds form. Interesting to me though, Jordan, that when people, we, we have conversations here, obviously through the, through the lens of Duke and Carolina being a blue blood and is UConn a blue blood. I think UConn has figured out and Danny Hurley has figured out the right recipe because Duke this year, this didn't go into the transfer portal and add the right players. They didn't add any players. <laughs> Carolina has figured out this year in Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan, how to one of your Notre Dame guys, how do you add players that help the, the existing parts? And next year they've added some McDonald's all Americans. So we'll see how that works out. But UConn, I think a lot of people don't know down here. They should. Tristan Newton is an ECU transfer uh -huh. and Cam Spencer, while he had a stop at Rutgers began his career at Loyola. So, so to me, I've been screaming this all year. Like, the difference between these teams, other than UConn, is, it's just very minimal. And even think about UConn. They're not out here, you know, with, with G League Ignite superstars and all this other stuff. An ECU transfer and a guy who began his career at Loyola. But it's guys that fit uh, a coach's system and fit early yes. system. And that's what works. And Cormac Ryan fits what they're trying to do 
at Carolina, and he also brought an element of toughness. But beyond yes. that, I remember a conversation I, I had with Coach Jeff Capel, a guy I greatly respect. And I think he's one of the truly underrated coaches. Everybody appreciates his ability to recruit, but I think they 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 undersell his ability to coach. And also just how he sees things in the college landscape and in the game itself. Jeff Capel said to me, Coach Jeff Capel said to me early on in the year, he's like, man, everybody talks about they got this guy in the portal coming and it's going to change the day and the fans get all excited about it. And, and to a degree, that makes sense. But you have no idea who these guys are until they're actually in your locker room. You don't know how they get along with the team. You don't know what their personality is when they're getting coached by you. Uh, you don't know how they are coming off a win and how they handle success, how they are coming off a loss uh, and handle and handle you know struggles. All of that gets figured out real time. So every guy in the transfer portal is a sincere roll of the dice, whether they check the boxes for you and your style, they have to come in personality wise, fit with the team and be able to work with the coach for the greater good. UConn has figured out a way to grab guys that work. Coach Hurley, for all his intensity and passion, he's an incredibly likable guy. I liken him to Bob Huggins during Bob Huggins' prime years at Cincinnati. People are like, man, oh, that guy's, you know, whatever. Yeah. No, his players would run through a wall for him. Same for Hurley's guys. And there's nobody more affable uh, when you look at Carolina than Coach Hubert Davis. And also, speaking of affable, Cormac Ryan is an incredibly likable guy who puts his hard hat on and goes to work every day. They just fit. And that's why these two teams are in the position they are right now to do something really special. You did see NC State play earlier this year. Uh, I think like most people, if I had told you that they were going to go on to win the ACC <laughs> tournament and then they were going to make the Sweet 16, if I told you that day where you were here, you would have been like, Shh, I need some of your drugs that you're on. <laughs> but what do you make of the Wolfpack's run? Just, you know, with your look right now, everybody would expect you to ask that very question. <laughs> um, where are your drugs? Just so we're clear. Yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, I, I, I actually love the look. I think it's so <laughs> it's great. That's why I'm joking with you. No, we're good. Uh, what was the question anyway? What were, what, I kind of lost. You, you were here. Were you here for the Boston College game? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How? Oh, yeah. You're here in and if I told you, like, hey, <laughs> it was such a forgettable game, and I think that was like Super Bowl Sunday, or maybe it was in the middle of the football playoffs, NFL playoffs. I, I can't remember, but I remember thinking, and I love Coach Keats. Like, yeah. I love love Coach Keats, and I was thinking man, I wish I could be anywhere, but right here, right now. And I'm blessed to have the job. I love calling these games, but it was brutal. And um, I came out of there, yeah, I, I didn't know what NC State was going to be like. Um, but I'll tell you what, if there's if, – is there a more intriguing athletic offering in college than NC State with everything that's happened with them? And you know well, you cover it. You cover it extensively. But for those who are listening to this that don't really know, I, I just – I have a dynamic relationship with NC State. I have a lot of people I love there. Uh, I think their fan base is one of the all-time fan bases because of how passionate they are. Are they unreasonable at times? Maybe. But are they passionate? Yeah. Yes. And that is to be cherished. I respect them a great deal. Uh, I went sideways with them once before. It'll never happen again. Uh, that being said, I think NC State's story is the coolest story in the tournament right now. And, of course, it's NC State that has that element because – it's NC State. I mean, the, the seven games that they've rattled off, it's been incredible. And to be there and watch them play those two games in the opening weekend in Pittsburgh, I, I mean, I was so happy for Coach Keats. I was so happy for um, another friend of mine, Boo Corgan. Um, but I was, I was happy for those guys. I mean, DJ Burns in, in the building, I, in, the, in the building, and I don't know if this came across on the TV broadcast, but every time he touched the ball down the stretch, Everyone was united in cheering for this guy outside of the opposition's fans. Yeah. He, he's become what he is down there in these sites. He's now traveling in the tournament. Um, DJ Horn has been, has been great, but the real revelation is Michael O'Connell. I, I mean, his confidence in how he fits in with how those guards play, picking and choosing his spots. He seems like he's making the right decision when to take a shot, when to facilitate, when to retreat dribble, when to attack, when to go in transition. And that's the thing about this NC State team. Everybody is assuming a role and elevating them. Ben Middlebrooks, I mean, how about him? 
How about him coming off the bench and helping? Oh, Diara. Yeah, I mean, all of them. I mean, Diara has been incredible for this group. They're front. They're winning with their front line at times, and then other times it's their guards. They're a dynamic team right now, and I have great faith in them. You'll appreciate this. It was a Carolina fan who sent it to me. Like, NC State's on a heater right now, playing their best basketball at the end of the year with one main primary post player and a second big that can stretch the floor. He goes... They're winning and they're playing at an up tempo when they have to, and in the half court when they can. He goes, they're winning by playing the way that Roy Williams loved to play. <laughs> he goes, wow. he goes, think wow. about that. And I have not wow. advanced that theory yet. And it was a Carolina fan, and I'm like, you're right, you're right. A lot of Carolina fans were like, oh, get Roy out of there because that that style doesn't work anymore. And now all of a sudden, it's you working. see it make it's what else they're doing. They're, they're they're better with the basketball, JG. They're guarding at a different. Yeah, they're level. defending. Yeah, out of really there. And that was what's been absent the lion's share of the year for this group. Coach Keats is another guy. He's a hell of a coach. I know it doesn't always go how everyone would see it fit. There's been some inconsistency, but he's also had uh, – he's been dealt a, an interesting hand at NC State. And, and right now he's getting his flowers and he deserves it. Uh, this group, why, why wouldn't you believe in them in, in every game moving forward? I, I they, They've bottled up something special. The only thing I worry about with them is – they stopped playing for a week. Like they probably wanted to get back oh, they to get back out there. Yep. They probably wish they could tip off on, on Monday or Tuesday and keep the good vibes going. The other team down in Dallas is Duke taking on Houston, the top seed. This feels like a, a mismatch on paper to me, Jordan. But I have a stat for you. This is the fifth time our three triangle teams have made the Sweet 16 together. In the previous four years, at least Duke or Carolina has advanced to the Final Four. And in the last two trips, 15, Duke won the national title. And in five, Carolina won the national title. So maybe I'm selling Duke short. How do you see Duke's chances against Houston? I, I think there's something in you and innately in everybody where because Duke gets all the, the fanfare and gets all the preseason love and, you know, they don't live up to that throughout the year, that maybe there's a belief that eh, the money's probably going to go Duke's side because they're the Cowboys, they're, they're this, they're that. Now, now they're facing number one Houston, so it's not going to go that route. But what is fascinating to me, and I'm sure this has been discussed with you and Joe. I know it's been discussed in other circles. But immediately when I saw that that matchup, I said, wow, what an opportunity for Duke. Not for Houston. What an opportunity for Duke. Duke is soft. That's what everybody says about yeah. Duke. Duke yeah. is soft. Duke doesn't have any toughness. Filipowski may go be a pro, whatever. Jared McCain paints his nails and sings TikTok songs. This group is soft. Now, this are my words. This is how people right, view right, this dude. Right, right. On the floor, they haven't played with the toughness on the floor. They're not winning the 50-50 basketballs. They're not doing the things necessary. So Duke feels very white-collar to people, and historically they have. What an opportunity for Duke to go beat a rugged Houston team that dictates how a team Tough. is going to be played. Yeah, And that's what the tournament's about. It's about getting over humps. I'm looking at – Brad Underwood with Illinois. They haven't been to the second weekend. Now, he hasn't been there all those years. But Illinois has gotten to the second weekend since 05 when it went to the national title game and lost to North Carolina. Yeah. I mean, th this is these are this is what the tournament allows itself. Redemption, flip of narratives. And Duke has a heck of an opportunity to do just that. I did mention Kyle Filipowski. He's got to be better for this group if they're if they're going to beat Houston. I mean, you got to be firing from all cylinders. A three ball, as it's been going for Duke, has to continue. But Filipowski's got to be a walking double double machine. Jordan Kinnett, you can watch him on NBA TV, NBC Sports. You can listen to him on Westwood One Radio. He's out at the East Regional in Boston. He will have those games. Uh, before we let you go, you mentioned Illinois losing to Carolina in the title game. Uh, Joe and I have spent a lot of time this year talking about what Carolina is and what they aren't. And in the regular season, they were the best team in the ACC. Check. Uh, as the number one overall seed, we all expected them to get to the Sweet 16. It's interesting, though, in the gambling markets, Arizona is the favorite to come out of that region. How do you see LA? And, and are you as intrigued from a distance as we all are here in the triangle at the potential of seeing Carolina and Caleb Love reunite with a spot on the Final Four? On I the mean, line? I truthfully don't hope that happens just because enough has been around the conversation yeah. of Caleb Love. Well, yeah, you lived through it last year. So you're, yeah. you're familiar I'm, with I'm, both yeah, of them. Yeah. I'm ecstatic for both of them. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the two backcourt mates, that there's so much discussion of why it's not working and one needs to go and who's the right one. And 
Both of them are conference players of the year. I love that. I want to see everybody win. That's who I am. Uh, so I'm excited for that. I mean, look, I, I guess I'm rooting for both to win. And if that happens, that gets them to facing each other. Um, and they might want that. Who knows? Um, both guys fire at a high level. To me, though, Carolina should be the favorite coming out of there because they're so freaking old. Like, they are. Guys. They are. Guys. And, like, I, I played the game. <clears throat> like, when I was 18 and I played fifth-year guys, like – or I played like a Mike Sweetney who is 350 pounds. By the way, DJ Burns ain't 270. Like somebody no, needs no, no, no. a job for putting that it's, in the media. It's 320 plus. Yeah. 270. I mean, how egregious, <laughs> how flagrant of a lie is 270? Anyway, I digress. Well, as a coach, you got to protect your guys sometimes. <laughs> yeah. you know, sometimes. sometimes you got to motivate right. them. Sometimes right. you got to protect them. I came out as 6'11 because I wanted the scouts to see I was a 3 and D guy, and I was really 6'8 and a half. So I get it. Yeah. Um, but as an 18 year old and you're going against like a, a, an older guy, that's an advantage. It's an advantage. And when you've got as many guys above 21 on your roster, it doesn't allow you to win, but it's something to lean on in turbulent moments. You want elder voices. You want vet voices to steady the ship. You want a guy that can say, all right, I'm going to lean on this 22 year old right now. We need a bucket or we need a stop. Or we need a block out. I'm going to lean on this 23 year old right here. I'm going to lean on this 24 year. That matters. To me, not to everybody, but I think that's important. And I think this group has gone through it last year. Two years ago, they went through it in that second half of that championship game. But there's a lot of great from that Carolina team two years ago. There's a lot of awful last year. And I think the guy best suited to handle that is a glass half full, uh, faith laden guy like Coach Davis, who never let himself get too high, never let himself, more importantly, get too low. And his team has fed off of that, and I think they're poised. And po being poised right now matters, and also the relationships within the locker room matter right now. And this is under-discussed. Guys hate each other by this time of the year. Even if you're winning, it's a long <laughs> time to be around each other. Yeah. And to start to come to the forefront, you know, just a lingering, man, we've been doing this for a long time. Even though it's the high of winning, not all teams are aligned, even in the winning. Who are the teams that get along most? Um, that's why I love Cormac Ryan being added to this Carolina team. He just fits. I like Carolina to come out of the West. I do. Well, Jordan Cornette, it's NBA TV, NBC Sports, Westwood Run, Westwood One Radio. Can we please add OG Media to this? Please don't be a stranger. You're the best, JG. Good being right. with you, brother. Enjoy the madness, my friend. Yeah, same to you, my friend. Enjoy, enjoy uh, Boston. Be good. love Jordan Cornette kind of sad that I wasn't here for that conversation because he's he's banging on you with your hair mm -hmm. okay I see you've tried to do something to get some control I, of it. I tamed it today you did you did you did tame it just a smidge just a smidge but I I would like to point out that Jordan pulled off a shock of smart where everybody assumed he was bald because that's how he would keep his hair oh okay and then all of a sudden pandemic rolls around and my dude's got hair. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. For somebody like me, that's almost insulting. <laughs> but I'll take it up with Jordan another day. Uh, I, w I did want to, before we get into some of the DraftKings stuff and use the promo code OG24 right now to, uh, to start your adventures on the DraftKings app. Uh, I certainly had some fun today picking the, uh, a few of their parlays. I love the parlays, man. They have the ready-made parlays for me. Mm. You put five bucks down. What you get on me about this, but I've actually, I've I've actually pulled some of these parlays off, man. I like it. You you not so much. Everyone has to run their own race, Joe. <laughs> if you like the prepackaged parlays, then you partake. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what to do with your bonus bucks, sir. Hey, you just as long as you sign up at DraftKings using that promo code OG24 and help me, yeah. help us, yeah. Via con Dios. By the way, it goes beyond just those uh, those bonus bets. You also get oh, yeah. you get like parlay. There's boost uh, insurance. There's boosts. insurance bets. Yeah, also, there's a lot. There's no sweat bets are great. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you know what? I'm I'm just gonna take a flyer on this, right? There you go. So they got all sorts of features on the app, uh, which are great. Here's the thing I wanted to say about the three teams, right? 
With NC State at this point, and, and Kevin Keats actually addressed it during his press availability today, they're on a hot streak right now, but I think at this point, based on who they've beaten and how they've got here, it's no longer about a hot streak. They've clicked. That's what matters. They've clicked. If you want to talk about getting on a heater during the ACC tournament run, fine. But once you've gotten to this point and the teams they've beaten to get to this point and who they'd have to beat tonight, at this point, that's just a credit to this team, a credit to this coaching staff for having it finally click for them. And I have to be true to how I talk about stuff when it comes to college basketball in this modern era, when it when, when we discuss rosters taking different times to finally become what they should be. Sometimes it never happens for them, right? Sometimes it never happens. Like Kansas has talked about that. Bill Self talked about, yeah, given the group that we had, I started thinking about what we needed to do for next year. I think it was a quote that was taken a lot out of context this weekend with what Bill Self had said about, I started thinking about next year, about a month ago, or what's going on at Kentucky, where that's a different situation where I think John Calipari, the game has kind of passed him by in how he's trying to construct things at Kentucky, and it's just not working for him anymore. And he has to actually get with the times and work that transfer portal in a better way rather than relying on the freshman. Keats, to his credit, to Steve Forbes's credit, to what Hubert Davis did this past offseason to try to get the right pieces together, something I think John Shire is learning after this season, you have to get the right pieces. It might take a little bit of a longer time to make it work. So credit to NC State. Here's the thing about Duke. I think it's a bad matchup for Duke. But I think they're kind of afforded the same thing as well, where it took a while for all these pieces to finally get together and who was going to do what. Do I expect Jared McCain to be dropping 13 threes a night? No, I don't. But whatever happened at the ACC tournament, however they ended the season losing to Carolina and how they lost to NC State, I do think that getting into this tournament finally got them to wake up a little bit. I think tonight's game is going to be a little, or tomorrow night's game is going to be a little bit closer than people give credit. It's the North Carolina game against Alabama that I'm most intrigued by. Most intrigued by. Because you got to remember, Alabama is coached by the guy that everybody loves. You just got this big contract extension. I right? wonder why. Why did he get that extension? Why did he get that extension, Joe? That's weird. How did he get that extension? That's so weird. Was he close to anything? That's really weird. Not close to anything, right? Wasn't nah, close to anything, right? Not close. And this is why I think I like Carolina tonight. Basically, I'm, basically, I'm, I'm bouncing off of what Cornette talked about. At this point, North Carolina knows what the deal is. They know what they are. They know what they have to be. And they've been through it enough times. The team like Alabama, they haven't they haven't gone through the ring. Oh, Alabama's ships in the night. Like last year, they had the most talented lineup. They were the number one overall yes. season tournament. They fell short. They fell short. This year, they're a little bit of a surprise. Obviously, still a very athletic team. They can score. The total in this game is 20 more points than any of the other seven games on the board. That raises an eyebrow to me. I say take the under because Same. because North Carolina is going to do. It gets back to something we talked about last week. You pointed out in that. What does the SEC do? Oh, yeah. they can they can run up and down the floor. They can score. They can. But look, what does Car- look really good coming off the bus? But what do they do when you actually get them on the court? They and struggle in the half court. They struggle in the half court. It was North Carolina done a really good job of all year. They've excelled in the half court. Yes, which is not something that people have talked about or are, are used to seeing out of North Carolina. Which is why I like the Star Heels tonight. I don't think we're going to get all three to advance to the lead eight. I don't think we're going to get all three, but I think two of them are. And I think it's going to be Carolina. I think it's going to be NC State. And Duke's going to be home, which is unfortunate because if, look, I want to thank the Triangle Schools for helping us out. Mm -hmm. We're having a monster march. Yeah. A monster march on the podcast. I could not have asked for a better start to the podcast as we try to do these things. I could not have asked for a better situation from NC State winning the ACC tournament to these three teams being in the Sweet 16. I don't want to be greedy. Okay. I don't want to be greedy, but because you know what's in front of us, right? You know what's in front of us. I don't. State and Duke could play in the Elite Eight. Okay. Okay. With a right to get to the Final Four, which is awesome. All right. And then let's say State wins and gets to the championship, and Carolina wins, and they get past... I, mean, I haven't even brought up the Caleb Love thing, right? right. Get the Caleb Love storyline, and Carolina gets to the champ. Are you telling me that we are looking at the possibility of State having to get through Duke and then meet Carolina in a championship game? And we're trying to increase, like, viewership? Come on. 
I don't want to be greedy, Joe, but you see what's in front of us, right? A, bo- a bonanza of viewership. How about, how about we just take the one game in front of us? Okay. You're right. Our OG play of the day. All right. I think we're, right. we're aligned on this one. I think Which so. might be scary. Okay. I got the heels minus four and a half tonight. Favorites went 11 and five in the previous round. Carolina now not has won nine of their last 11 sweet 16 games. Mm-hmm. Does give me pause. The last time they were in LA, they were a four seed and lost to a really good Wisconsin team. I don't think that's who Alabama is. I like the heels to cover tonight. Minus four and a half. I, uh, I have to log into the DraftKings app here real quick because I have a few of these built parlays oh boy. that you hate, but I love. You tell me which one actually sounds pretty good. I actually saw, I actually really like this one. This is a five pick parlay where I have all these key guys making over two and a half threes. Caleb Love over two and a half. R.J. Davis over two and a half. Cam Jones over two and a half. Jared McCain over two and a half. I mean, come on, you not liking those odds? Remember when I lost the R.J. Davis three point yeah, bet at the that. ACC tournament? I do remember because that. I realized oh. Shit, he doesn't really attempt three pointers. He likes to go to the basket way too much. I also love this from DraftKings. They called this accomplished greatness, which happens <laughs> to be the ACC's tagline. Yes. That's their marketing tagline. They called yes. this four pick parlay accomplished greatness. And this is uh, plus, uh, plus 1228. All teams covering. So that's North Carolina minus four and a half, Duke plus four, Clemson plus seven, and NC State plus six and a half. It'll pay out nicely. Sure. If they all cover. Yes. <laughs> and then there's an even wackier one. A six-pick uh, parlay, how? Joe. How could it be wackier? A six-pick parlay. It's six, six legs. Okay. Six legs. I love it. Anyway, it's all about Caleb Love and UNC. So anyway. These you're, are all... you're still rolling on your free roll, though. What do you mean? You're, you're, the money you are gambling with is the, the free money that you were. Oh, no, I used all that up. Okay. I have some futures. No, but but have you some... won. Oh, yeah, I've won. So that's the money you're gambling with. You're not gambling with your money. Oh, I'm up. Yeah. There I'm you up. go. I'm up. I'm having some fun with it. And that's the thing. I think that's the key part because there's been a lot of conversation about this stuff. The whole point of this is to have some fun with it. And I've been enjoying the DraftKings app uh, in a lot of ways. And I've had a lot of fun with it. You can have some fun with it too. It's all live, obviously, here in the state of North Carolina. What's that? Oh, what do you see in the comment section? And we're talking about <laughs> Joe <laughs> I mean, now he may be talking about something else, but it, it does apply to your wackadoo. Uh, maybe, 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 maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the case. Anyway, uh, so head on over to DraftKings, download the app today. They are the official sports betting partner of NASCAR. And you can legally bet on all your favorite sports anytime, anywhere, right here in North Carolina. Now that's live, you can have some fun with it the same way that I'm doing with a lot of these pre-built parlays from DraftKings. Best features. Again, those same game parlays are awesome. The player props are a lot of fun and fast and easy payouts right at your fingertips. And you can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now using the code OG24. Bet $5 to get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on the DraftKings Sportsbook with OG24 as the promo code. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 877. I screwed up. Call 877-18-5543 or visit morethanagame.nc.gov. 21 plus North Carolina only bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance deposit and eligibility restrictions apply terms at draftkings.com slash sportsbook slash NC NASCAR is not a sponsor of this promotion and used under license. The reason why I screwed up is because I got new progressive lenses. I got a new prescription and I'm not, you also I'm not quite used. To I it think yet. you also refuse to take it out of like that old radio grid. No, I have that they to. sent it over. Oh, I took oh, it out. Oh. I, my phone number might be bad form, but I feel like we should send both clips to DraftKings and be like, say like, hey, who do you prefer to read this All right. ad? And we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we'll the see agency, what they come back. We'll with. see what the agency says. I like A lot of folks in the YouTube comment section uh, from Evan. We love Thick Stormy. Yes. Yeah. I had a couple of people asking, where's that shirt from? This is from the eye. It is the Thick Stormy Carolina Hurricanes. I, they had a special one-off jersey 
that we'll I see. Yes, that I, we'll, we'll be seeing. I was not quick enough to get that jersey. It's kind of sad. I was going to put that on the OG card, but well, that's good. <laughs> is what it is. Is what it is. Did you get your OG card back? Uh, no, I need to go get it today. <laughs> uh, from Will, two things the Northeastern sports writers have never forgiven us, and it's breaking up the Big East. And I think there is some intentional tamping down of the ACC at its core competency. And maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the case. I'm glad to see the uh, Jim Phillips ACC commissioner finally went out there and started to uh, talk about the ACC openly. From Eric, bracketology isn't real. They're just a guess at what the committee will do. My issue is that the committee is biased because bracketology is so prominent. Eh. There's an unintentional seep there. I, I agree. Okay. Okay. From Martin, you can't say the ACC is a bad league because of their seeding the last five years while ignoring tournament results. Right. I think that's ultimately what it is. Um, you have to pick a lane. What are we talking about here? And at some point, you do have to ask the question, why is it that the ACC continues to perform better than what we discussed during the course of the regular season? And this, you know, I think it was from Matt. Yeah, this is. I realize it's easy to bang on the college football playoff committee, but I do think it's helpful that they do a weekly update of the at-large bid teams starting on February 1st each, uh, each season. The, the, the committee has tried to dabble with that. I think it's a little bit more unwieldy compared to the college football playoff. I also would point this out about the college football playoff. While I do appreciate the look-ins, the look-ins are made for television. And the only one that ultimately matters is the one at the end. And they'll justify whatever at the time for it was that they wanted. Um, and you could see it with the positioning of the rest of the top 25 so they could justify who it was that was moving up and moving down. So those are the types of things that, while I get what you're trying to say, let's not give the look-ins too much credit because, again, they are meant to be a, uh, it's a made-for-television event. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for today's show. We have an OG After Dark tonight following the Carolina-Alabama game. Brownlow and I, We'll be doing that. That's what a 940 tip scheduled tip. I think you got a late one there, sir. <sighs> 939. Clemp and AZ is at 709. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Let's give you a Celsius night. Okay. And then we'll be here Friday after the state game. Yeah. What do you want to do about that? Because Duke plays after that. Yeah, do I'm just. Do we just want to react to state? I'm, I'm, do you want to keep ignoring I'm Duke? Going to lean in on my Duke takes because Duke's season ends tomorrow. So okay, okay, that's fine. If, you know what? If anything, Duke fans probably want you to keep ignoring them. That's right, because then they'll just keep winning. That's right. right. That's how it works. Not only ignoring but picking against. Them. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> Uh, so I guess what you're saying is Duke to the Elite Eight. We'll talk about it on Friday night. Yes. We'll see what happens. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll do something on Friday night. Uh, we'll probably go live around halftime. How about this? How about we go live at halftime of the Duke-Houston game? Perfect. That way it gives us time to watch the game at home and all that stuff, then head up to the studio and get settled and everything else. Does that work? Yeah, I'll be at the beach, but I, I will chime in from with my computer. You bring in the fancy mic? Uh, yeah, that's at home. And you wonder why we have so many microphones. You never know when you're going to need it, Joe. You never know when you're going to so need it. So many microphones. All right, that's going to wrap it up. Thanks for checking us out this week. We will see you back here tonight after that North Carolina-Alabama game. And, of course, we'll see you on Friday night after the state Marquette game. Mm -hmm.